No, you get an STD test. Coming up on the Fraudcast. In the states who are abroad, no one's safe from the talk is a fraud. In the states who are abroad, no one's safe from the talk is a fraud. The following goes beyond the show and beyond the gram to bring you all the fraud that's fit to be uncovered. This is the Fraudcast. And now, here are your Fraudcasters, Hanakawa and Katrina. <laughs> <laughs> oh hi welcome back you guys hi happy quarantine everyone how are we hanging in there <laughs> happy quarantine day 11 with me, me. as always is <laughs> hannah kawa <laughs> and also joining us by remote feed this time instead of live in studio we have agent c how are you hanging out over there how are you doing agent c? i'm doing fine in my undisclosed location <laughs> across town. Cause he can't come over to my house, <laughs> a responsible social distance away. Yes. You know, I've, I've been practicing social distancing for like 18 months. <laughs> it's all good. I've been ready for this. I've been training for this my whole life. Right? I'm like, this is years in the making. People are like, how do you deal with not going anywhere? It's like, <laughs> wait, wait, you guys, you guys go places. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Sometimes. You, you go outside. <laughs> oh no, we don't do that. No, no. <laughs> I put on a real bra the other day instead of a sleeping bra. And I was like, ooh, I'm getting fancy. <laughs> I know. That outdoor support. I know, right? Just to go walk the dogs outside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So how, how was everybody hanging in there? Uh, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the kid is actually not as... Um, he's not devouring my soul as quickly as I had worried. Okay, that's good. Um. Yeah, so we're good. I don't have my kids, so they can't come over right now because of responsible show, so, social distancing and all. They may have been exposed, so they can't. They're at their other parents and can't come over yet because God knows what they were exposed to before they went on lockdown. And me being um, immunocompromised, I can't risk them bringing cooties over yet. So they're not allowed over. So anyway, right. <laughs> how are you doing, Agency? <laughs> I am doing fine. I've had a lot of time to perfect my uh, barista technique. So I've been trying to make coffee that doesn't make me want to throw up uh, these last few fancy, days. Fancy pour over coffee. That's correct. I showed you guys before we got on to uh, got on to the, the recording. Right. We saw a video um demonstration of his most recent technique mm -hmm. you guys it's riveting <laughs> riveting documentary film here yeah um, i will say though if i if i start throwing up in the middle of the show it's not because i have coronavirus it's because the coffee i made actually kind of sucks oh my god <laughs> it's coffee snob. i feel like i'm gonna have to take agency offline and give him a little one-on-one -on -one barista advice um <laughs> <laughs> on how not to make your stuff too acidic when doing a pour over. Cause that's usually what kills people. Oh yeah. my God. I have no idea what you guys are talking about. I just put a <laughs> K cup in my Keurig and pour it. You know, I'm an alcoholic. I go to a lot of meetings where people make really bad coffee. If I can't afford to be a coffee snob. Otherwise like, it, yeah, no, there's a lot of bad coffee at the meetings I go to. So yeah, I <laughs> am a coffee slut. So I usually take it in all forms. <laughs> My favorite is actually diner coffee because it's intentionally bad and it's pretty much colored water that's hot. And I'm like, this is fantastic. So. <laughs> there is diner coffee is, a, is its unique sort of treasure, I would say. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I actually, for, for as horrible a human being as I am about coffee, I actually really like diner coffee. And I, <laughs> I'm sort of, I'm sort of sorry, not sorry about it. <laughs> right. It's like it's like everyone's hidden dirty secret who loves coffee. They're like, we love going to the diner. Just to it's all coffee. good to me. I'm just I guess I'm not <laughs> I'm I'm kind of like you. I am mean, I'm a slut. I'll take it in all forms. Um, you know, why not? If it's there, I'll drink it. <laughs> oh, gosh. OK, so um, speaking of sluts, <laughs> let's move to 90 day. <laughs> No, Let's they're not the slut. 90 day slut fest. Um, there was a lot of sex happening. There were there were some sex happening on this this episode. Um, we don't have really any major fraud at the moment. So we're, we're kind of going to go I'll talk a little bit about the um, 
the episode and some thoughts we have about some of the ongoing things that happened and sort of what we know. And then we're going to move into some agency visa stuff. He's been um, hoarding, uh, like you guys are hoarding toilet paper. He's been hoarding questions for visa on visa stuff. So he's going to answer all those in um, that segment. But first, we're going to talk about the show. So, we're did we start the show with Lisa and Usman, or I can't remember if the show started that I way. I feel like we always start the show with Lisa and Usman. Like they're the openers, and they're always in bed. Yeah, so they're waking up the, another morning after. I guess another one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they're talking about Usman's concert that he has coming up. Um, to debut his video, his baby girl Lisa video, I Love You song. And she is really concerned about the female reaction, the female reaction that she's going to witness there. And then they um, he takes her on a surprise visit, you guys. Very exciting ex- <laughs> surprise visit to the very room that he wrote her song in. And I swear to God, right, if she right. says, oh, my God, this is where he wrote my song, my song. Oh, my God, it's my song. This is exactly where he wrote it. Oh, my God. I swear to God, I was wanted to punch her. It's like I think each each uh, couple has like their own phrase that's repeated multiple times, along with he's a relationship coach. Mm-hmm. It's he wrote me a song mm-hmm. or the song was written for me. Therefore, anything related to the song, I have say over. It's so weird. Yeah. But um, he basically takes her to a closet. Right. With like some milk crates a, and a keyboard. <laughs> right. There's like this little DJ system, which is, I mean, if he made that song off what was in that room, there is more miracle happening <laughs> than we know. <laughs> because You know, that's the so, first time I've ever heard someone say he took her to a closet and then the story ended up on a good note. <laughs> I know without being pregnant, right? Yeah. Although, you know, given how Lisa talks about the song as if it's sort of a religious artifact, I'm surprised she didn't try to consecrate the space right there. I, you know, you're right. You're right. That's it. Oh, a good... thoughts. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> if dog. the friend if... wasn't there, maybe she would have taught him a little bit more about spontaneous American closet sex. Oh God. Oh. Speaking of friends, so this is one of his uh, Usman's business colleagues, and he comes over, and they start talking. And um, this apparently is the guy who made the original video. Mm-hmm. And so Lisa doesn't like him because she has, you know, her thoughts and opinions as as being the rap industry video director extraordinaire that she is. She's decided that the video didn't need to have the model in it and it should have had her instead in this ghost arethal form. So she doesn't like this guy. Right. And this guy is is like, he's like insulting her in with using like Nigerian slang that she doesn't understand, (laughs) like right to her face, which I think is hilarious. My goodness. When he was like, she's just kind of like, it's a music video, like, and and everyone who watches rap videos or any kind of music video knows that you rarely see the rapper's girlfriend or wife in a video, even if it's a love song or they feel like it was written about them. Mm -hmm. Like that's almost bad juju. Like you don't put your significant other in your video because that like means you're going to divorce. Yeah. I mean, the point of the song is to relate to lots of people, a wide audience, and you narrow it down, especially by putting a picture or a ghost form of Lisa into it. You're going to completely alienate, like you defeat the purpose of the song. I'm no rap director, music director, right? But my personal thoughts are that you're trying to relate to as wide an audience as possible, right? So why would you limit it by saying, oh, it can only be about this girl who was the original girl that it was written for? To put it a different way, the whole point of the music video is for his fans to want to be baby girl Lisa. And so they need a stand in that they can project themselves onto. And I hate to say it, guys, Lisa is not someone who his fan base can easily project themselves onto. (laughs) You don't say I know this is this is some this is some mega mind material right here. Right. 
mind blowing. But on that even. on that note too, it's it's almost like the audience for the song is going to be women mm-hmm. and maybe some men, um, but majority of the fan base that's going to be desiring Soja Boy singing to them about loving them is right. is going to be women, and I don't want there to be a face that I feel I have to compete with in a song. Right. Like you, ha- it's okay to like, like. Lisa needs to let go of the fact. Okay, yes, the song was written for her allegedly. I mean, I, I have my doubts about that, but whatever. He tells her it's written for her. For all intents and purposes, it's written for her. She just needs to right. be okay with that, and the rest of it doesn't mean it's actually literally her in the video, <laughs> even though she's the one that it was written about. Right. Like, and then can we say that having her in ghost form would almost make me think it was one of those. Do you remember that? Is it what was he Puff Daddy back then when they sang that song for the rapper that got shot? And it had like his his ghost image in the background. Like, I would think that the song was a memorial song. Right. <laughs> if I saw like this random visions of Lisa in the clouds, this <laughs> random white girl like floating in the background. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Right? His fans would say, God, Usman, you really don't look like your mother. <laughs> oh, no. People are already making those jokes, man. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Unfortunately, you can't avoid it when you date someone 20, 30 years your Who could junior. be your actual mother. Um, right. Yeah. So then, I mean, they go on and they, they, they are trying to explain this to her. I guess they're, they're eating. They go to eat and they're trying to explain this to her about her being jealous and, and trying to control the narrative of the the video and stuff is actually hurting his career. And she's like, um, no, you don't care about me or him. I don't, I couldn't follow her argument exactly. Um, I I don't think she had an argument. She was just against anyone who didn't want to have a music video with her in it. I think that was pretty much her only vision of, and then she was upset that he didn't defend her, but right. I don't know. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Like, it was just a mess. And then she got all mad and she storms off because he's not defending her or whatever. And and they're all, you know, well, he, you know, he needs to do this and this for his rap career. And he, she just doesn't want the, and she doesn't want the female fans and she wants her to be in the video. Like all of this stuff, it doesn't make any sense when you think about it from a business perspective. And nobody's necessarily explaining that to her though you know they're just like "Ah, okay well especially since i think he's just starting his rap career because like there's no songs from him before this i love you song (laughs) so her whole like i don't know what's going on here if he like decided to jump his career off with the show because that's what it seems like is happening Mm -hmm. um there's nothing about him or from him except for some weird like tele telenovela type mm-hmm. uh, movie that was put out there. But honestly, I feel like everything he's doing now is what sets his music career off. And so if she's really interfering. Then like he's never going to get there. But didn't they show early like the first episode that he was like some sort of goodwill ambassador? What's what's that? What was that all about? You know, I because it's probably local, like really local, like within his state, even local, like those places for awards he won, they have like websites ish kind of. But there's no like roster to show he's a peace ambassador. Like if you go to the U.N., the U.N. doesn't really I don't feel like it tracks like that. So I have no clue like what it means to be a peace ambassador. What could also be that where he it is. It could also be that they like needed somebody from that part of the country and he was literally the only person who qualified. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> or willing to do <laughs> it. <laughs> right. Like he has all these awards and stuff, but it's like for what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So <sighs> So the discussion all over social media and everything after the show has been this Lisa being so insecure about whatever the female reactions to him and then her trying to control the music video and neither of which are helpful to to Usman. But I feel like nobody is explaining that to her. 
And, and I don't think she's going to listen to anyone who attempts to explain it to her. That they just need to, that she just needs to back off. <laughs> right. That, that, yeah, whatever insecurity she has needs to be put to rest or something because, <laughs> oh my God, just the, we need to tighten up your Facebook. Yeah. I'd be like, tighten up, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tighten up your coochie. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else on them? Uh, no, I don't think I had anything else worth note. Okay. Um, we didn't have Darcy and Tom this episode. I think they're in the previews, though. Uh, they are not in this episode. They might have been in the previews. Um, for those who have already skipped ahead, they are going to be on the next episode. So I think they're just skipping. They probably don't have enough footage for them, so they're just skipping around the season. Okay. Uh, Stephanie and Erica. We finally meet Erica. Thoughts? I think she's cute. They both seem to be pretty... <laughs> Dare I say they, normal? They seem like it. I mean, if you... People? You're saying somebody with you know pink and blue hair is normal, then... It, uh, in my age, <laughs> it's totally, in my age bracket, no, but yes. you're right. You're absolutely <laughs> right. You know, she's just this walking rainbow and, um, yeah. And, and she seems fun. I think a lot of people were laughing though at her saying her parents uh-huh. didn't know she was by, like they questioned it. I'm like, she is a walking, <laughs> she's, a li- she's literally a walking rainbow, rainbow flag. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> Right. Like my my gaydar is like an acquired gaydar. But like as soon as like, yes, <laughs> yes, parents. Look. You know, and she is this bright, <laughs> colorful thing. But I feel like I don't feel like she's doing it in like that. I'm putting it on for a show way. Like, hey, look at me. You know how some people like I can't even think of it like it like it's not an affect on her. Right. Like it seems like it's just genuine. Yeah, it's not forced. I I. Yeah, I think she honestly likes all the things that she wears, does. Um, A lot of photographers have a bit of a funky style behind the camera. Um, I have a pair of (laughs) avocado earrings myself. Wild and crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Things I don't usually wear in public and I work in a very serious job, so avocado (laughs) earrings would probably not be the best thing to wear, but... Yeah, if anybody has seen the little things I have Uh around here, squishy hamburgers, plushies. Yeah, it's cute, but I don't feel like she's she's putting on a front um, of, hey, look at me. I'm so cool and different, you know. Right. Yeah. No, you read that right. I would I would agree. Yeah, It, it comes off as genuine. Her style, her mood, everything comes off as genuine. Cool. Um, mm-hmm. It was interesting. Her friends. Like, there's always the friend reaction when they go, oh, I've been talking to somebody for so long. And they're both just like, yeah, what? Because <laughs> all all these cast members are like, yeah, it's been four months. It's my and soulmate. It's I know it is. I'm ready to get married. <laughs> and you're like, oh, God. It's, it's my soulmate. But, you sure. know, if you've been talking for three months, four months, seven months, whatever, like, it's not out of the realm of normalcy to want to go and visit this person that you've been talking to. So I don't think that in and of itself is what right. is problematic to these friends. <laughs> it's the, Oh, they're my soulmate. I'm going to marry them. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you guys an observation I had about these two and keeping aside, um, you know, previous discussions about Stephanie. I think that given that these two are kind of a, I guess you could call them a a trailblazer couple. They're the first uh, gay couple that 90 Day has had on. I don't think they wanted to go very extreme with the kind of person they uh, they chose to Mm. be the first of that category. You know, they didn't want to bring it, have like a Colton Larissa or a um, I don't know, a a Danielle and Muhammad type pairing uh, for that for that category. So I think they played it a little bit safe. Um, just, just given kind of some of the meta sensitivities that I'm sure exist around, around that kind of, uh, representation. Right. right. Not to say there won't be drama. Yeah. They're, because right. if you put two women in any situation, <laughs> you're going to have an ounce of drama. Hey, that. Like, doesn't matter if you're straight, lesbian, bi. Okay. Those are your like, words. That you, you said that. <laughs> yes. Because I know. Yes. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, but they're they're really cute in their airport meeting, and so um, we'll see. You know, we'll see. You know, their storyline yes. seems to be a little bit along the lines of you know Stephanie is very celibate and has it, you know, is not this like super fast and loose woman. And, you know, she's wondering, you know, Erica is a very sexual person. Is she going to be okay with me waiting? Am I going to want to wait? You know, whatever. So it seems like that their storyline is going to be a bit about that, which we thought we were going to see with Ash and Avery when Avery's like, yeah, you're going to sleep in the other room. And we cut to them waking up Five in the same bed together. Five minutes later. <laughs> She's like, I couldn't resist such a hungry yeah, man. Yeah. Should we just move on to them? That's the transition. <laughs> that was the transition. That was <laughs> that was amazing. And the uh, producers are like, so did you go to sleep last night? She's like, does <laughs> it look like I went together. to sleep? <laughs> uh, I want to take a minute just to touch on, you know, we all make fun of Ash's eyes, his big buggy eyes, right? His crazy eyes, everyone's commenting on it. He did come out on social media and say that he has thyroid issues and possibly Graves' disease, which is what everybody's been speculating on that caused his eyes to do that. So I'm just going to put that out there. He did come out right, and said, you know, despite everybody making fun of him and all of this stuff, um, that this is, uh, this is the real situation. He did try to say before it was due to heart contacts, but it looks like he's come out and said it's, it's a thyroid issue, which... You know, it is it is what it is. It's not like you can do anything about it. You know, it doesn't mean we're still not going to call him crazy eyes. But. Right. I can. Im- <laughs> I, I can imagine that uh, we, we you know, we all have some kind of health issue that we necessarily don't uh, right. wish the whole world to know about. Like, why do I have to explain I have a health issue right. for you right. to stop saying I'm on cocaine? <laughs> but that's what um, it looks like he, he had to do, you know. Yeah, and people people still don't believe it. But at this <laughs> point, who cares? Like, the memes are going to be the mm-hmm. memes. The jokes are going to be the jokes. Um, those who care to know and understand, that's their thing. Um, what's that popular talk show host? Yolanda, is it Yolanda Williams? Who, what? what the... I forgot. Oh, okay. she, she has grave disease, too. And I remember, like, yeah, if you ever look her up, it's the same thing. So, of course, my mom, being a nurse, was like, oh, that looks familiar. It's like, oh, stop diagnosing people. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah, that's all we, well, that's not all we had on them. Because um, Avery gets to meet Ash's brother, who seems, who sounds like he's really uptight on anything <laughs> fun in life. No drinking, no no pot, yeah, no foreign he's a, women, he's a little, no sex. Um, he does seem a little um, uptight. They meet for dinner. Avery orders a dirt, extra dirty martini, which for record, for the record, I used to used to be my drink of choice. Um, and and Ash orders one, and I think it's really funny. And I texted this to you actually because a dirty martini, in and of itself, I think is an acquired taste because the dirty part is the olive juice. So you're drinking green olive juice in with your vodka. It's kind of a sort of a unique tasting drink, right? right? And she gets it extra dirty, which means a lot of a lot of olive juice. And so he orders that. Right. She wants right. that shit and I, Yeah, and I, I know yeah. exactly what she's talking about. So I don't know for somebody who doesn't drink much, if at all, or drink those to just go straight to an extra dirty martini, I think is a little bit, a little bit steep learning curve for you, Ash, but you know, Hey, you tried it. I think, I think he mainly ordered it and this could be his relationship coach coming out to make her feel like she Mm, had an ally in the situation. Because for me, I would not want to be the one drinking alone, looking like you know, yeah. being judged as an alcoholic or something. I'd like, I'd like my partner to get one too. So yeah. then the brother can be like, okay, whatever. Like, it doesn't feel like you're ganged up on, but yeah, the yeah. look on his face when he took that first sip was like, holy right. shit. Or I like just got a nice a beer. glass of wine or something <laughs> like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Some, mar- yeah. what is that? Moscato, something. That's what I'm saying. He went Like a hardcore. dirty martini <laughs> is, is, you know, that's, that's some unique tasting that's a unique taste um it's a very specific taste but 
Yeah, but he still, the brother still judges Ash for that. And it seems like he's judging him for his choice of woman. Gets into the stuff about his, uh, what about the kid? And, oh, she's, you know, you're going to move him to the United States. Like, you know, all of this stuff. So brother Avery or brother Ash is very, seems judgmental and uptight, which at this point could very well be TLC storyline. We don't know. We haven't, we haven't gotten that story. Right. And I, and I think he's worried about, you know, are you going to displace your kid? Like you're, you're with an American woman. You obviously, I mean, the choices isn't that he obviously has to go to America because Avery could very well go to Australia. So, I mean, um, did you guys pick up on the fact that when, uh, when Ash's brother asked him about taking his son to the U S it was really obvious that Ash has not talked to his son's mother about this at all. Really? I didn't pay attention. Oh, he could. Oh, he was he de- he deflected nine ways to Sunday. He did not answer the question. He just he talked around it with some very, very vague platitudes. And his his eyes were I can't remember exactly, but I felt like he was kind of looking around. He wasn't looking his brother in in the face, nor was he looking at Avery. He was kind of looking around and evading the question, which is, you know, you know, uh, grade A deception right there. He's 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 <laughs> he's trying to not lie, but also not tell the truth. Got it. That I, I mean, you know, this is just my uh, arm armchair speculation. But uh, if he was at my visa window telling me that, <laughs> I'd, I'd make a case note that he hasn't talked to mother. <laughs> he appears to be deceptive. Or the mother had a response, and he has not told Avery what the mother's response was. So he's just kind of like, bruh, chill it. <laughs> yeah. Hush. Anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to see if you guys picked up on that, because I definitely did. There was, there was a bit of awkwardness there. Just uh, w- we'll see how that unfolds. Right? I always go directly to the it's TLC frauding, and it's, it's a setup produced storyline. And so that's what my instinct was. But... Uh, we, at this point, as the broadcast team, we don't know the specifics on this yet. We have not gotten information one way or the other about Brother Ash's storyline, whether it's real or fake or not. So, Yeah, and, and I'll just clarify. This is just my armchair speculation. I have no hard evidence to go on to say that, uh, you know, he hasn't are talked to Are you trying to, to say that your views are yours, your views alone and not those of the broadcast? They do not represent the fraudcast necessarily. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so um, then David and Lana, Dave heads off to Ukraine and meets up with, uh, what's her name? Anya? What's the name of that girl? Uh, Anya. Yeah. Yeah, so surprise for the audience, he gets off the airplane, meets Anya, which... It's interesting how like all like it feels like last minute he meets her. Like for what reason? I I don't know because he drives the car. He knows where he's going. It's almost like he just wanted to say hi to her in person. Or it's because TLC wanted a greet at the airport moment. <laughs> right. Which right. get which makes us go, huh, does that mean Lana may not come? Because you know, yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Well, and, and Anya is, so he had met her previously online and, and then met her, um, in person on one of his, uh, love me Russian bride tourism trips that he took over there and, um, they didn't hit it off. So his commentary on it was she was too shy and her commentary is it was clear there was no chemistry. So, right. Um, you know, when she, when he first said, oh, she's too shy, it means like, to me, it says, oh, she didn't want to sleep with you. (laughs) Right. Well, can we point out, can we, can we, um, highlight the perhaps irony that he thought she was too shy, but Lana is so shy. She won't even talk to him on the phone. Right. (laughs) They're all very shy. They're all very shy. Um, but he's been doing this for, I think he said, what, 20 years? These Russian women. Yeah, he's gone on 40 trips to, to Ukraine Jeez. and Russia area, 40 trips, and he's dated over 100 women. I don't know if I buy that. Like, define dating. Well, we all know what dating on this site is, talking to him on the site. That's what they consider <laughs> dating. 
We're going we're going back into high school where we were dating because we wrote a note to each other. Right. And we said, no, this I out. don't I don't know how in depth they were. But you know. life mate and I had this very same comment when we were watching the documentary Love Me, which, by the way, if you want a video watch along, um, it's up on our Patreon is me and Hetero Life Mate watched that documentary and videoed it. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So it's up on the Patreon if you're interested in seeing his reaction to the first time seeing it. But one of the guys there said the same thing about how he had dated like 30 to 50 women. And we're like, well, what did you find dating? If he's like, did you email them and they emailed you back? Which, by the way, was on the show was or on um, the movie <laughs> was ten dollars a pop coming and going. You pay for both of those. So that's twenty dollars. Well, and these right. And these, these men have the means to talk like that. But I think like just how we are witnessing with like uh, Caesar and Maria and then Dave talking about, you know, uh, Lana in the past, I can imagine that they put more eggs in their basket. Mm -hmm. So when they go out there, maybe if this person and this person and this person doesn't want to meet, okay, I at least met two of them. Like, I think there's almost an expectation that these women are going to flake to some degree. Mm -hmm. Well, they should have that expectation. <laughs> so you, so you put a whole bunch in there and just do like this, you know, mini tour each time you go. Right. And <laughs> I hate to get ageist with you guys, but have you ever used like online dating apps? Like no. you don't got to go to Ukraine to prep for that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you do. If you have a preference though, if you prefer that type of woman, then that you're are, not going to meet that at your safe way down the street. And by type of woman, you mean somebody who's so desperate to get out of the Ukraine that they'll sleep with your sorry ass just to get out of the Ukraine, out of Ukraine. I was going to say someone who played in the Bullwinkle cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that too. I was going to say the other side of that, you know, is these women who uh, the only thing like their goal, entire goal in life is to get out of Ukraine. And he may be their ticket out. And he recognizes that. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's what we have with them. What I thought was hilarious with him is he's like needs to take these pictures with Lana so they can apply for the K-1 because, you know, one of the, right. you know, and, and agency, feel free to weigh in here. But as he said correctly on this on the show that one of the requirements of the K-1 is you have to prove that you have met before and that that's part of proving your bona fide relationship. So he's focused not so much on meeting her and let's hang out and do things together. It's let's meet so we can take these pictures so I can apply for your K-1. Right. That is correct. You have to provide evidence that you have met at least once in the last two years. Right. So, you know, I mean, he's concerned about sh setting up this photo shoot, not really concerned about oh, maybe it's a real relationship. Let's let's find out if it's real. Like he's all set to bring her over here on a K-1, regardless of whether they get along, whether you know what I mean? Like he's already set on that. And all he needs is pictures with her, not to actually establish a bona fide relationship. But we need pictures to show that. Right. I don't know. So, well, we'll see if he actually meets her, right? Yeah. We don't know if they're going to pull a Maria. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen with her. If, or right. if I think that I think it's I tell you guys, it's it's uh, it's Ricky and Melissa, uh, Melissa 2.0. <laughs> the A storyline and the B storyline. Right. right. Just sitting there. Yeah. Or if we do see her, it's going to be like the last, you know, two episodes of the darn show because they need to continue this like desperate, you know. Right. Need to meet her. Right. But, um, <laughs> and then our other our other desperate couple, Yolanda and Williams, we didn't see, did we see them this episode? No, no, Did they we, were on this one. No, they were. Yeah, they they were. She was. Well, she, she was, was talking more about him ghosting. And um, she was at the clothing store with her friend, I think, and trying to explain to her friend that she's going to go anyway. And friends like, yeah, no. <laughs> and she's like, I know, I, but I'm like, you're probably right, but I'm going to go anyway. He deleted his old well, the argument. <laughs> the argument she had, her friend has is weak. You don't know him and you've never met him. So you're going to go. She goes, yes, because if I go there, then I get to meet him. She goes, but you haven't met him. Like it was the most that it, yeah. circular <laughs> conversation <laughs> <Yeah>. ever. <laughs> the whole point was to go to meet him. Right. No, I agree. And, and there, there are much more rational reasons why she shouldn't go, which is all the red flags that 
Williams doesn't exist or he doesn't exist in the form that he claims that he is. And then his Instagram suddenly disappeared and whatever story he's giving her about it being hacked or whatever nonsense he's doing. I can't get in. I don't know. No, you, you deleted it and then restarted it (laughs) as this Nigerian dude that you are. The, The TLC producer that was running it actually shut it down. (laughs) <laughs> such a skeptic oh god um, that would be funny if they did um yeah so that's yolanda and williams all right so i think uh i think most of the thoughts of ed and rosemary you have i do too but i know you have some hot <laughs> thoughts you want to get out um, oh my god ed is such an entitled prick like who the fuck does he think he is Storming in there, being who he is with his, you know, being divorced, having cheated on his first wife, not having dated, whatever, all of the nonsense that that he's got in his life, lying to her about her, his height and all of this stuff to be this entitled piece of shit that he is demanding that she submit to an STD test because so, so his argument is like, okay, I don't know anything about your past. You won't tell me about your past, but if you take an STD test, that will suffice. Those two things don't equate to each other. Like taking an STD test and being free of STDs still doesn't explain any of her past. So if your thought is gen- genuinely that you want to know what her past is, then talk to her about that. Right. And, and talk to her in a caring manner that if a concerned boyfriend or, you know, wait till she brings it up, it's clearly painful for her. Right. Like why demand you know, that she submit to this invasive STD test that somehow makes, it means if it's negative that she's somehow absolved of whatever f- nonsense you think she's engaging in about her past that she won't tell you about. Cause she's allegedly being cagey about it. I think he's an entitled piece of shit. I don't think wanting to know about her past is in and of itself a bad motive, but the way he goes about it is completely not kosher in my book. And she was, had every right to be mad at him and storm off. So that's my And thought. throw it back at him, yes, right? Because yes. the STD test will only, will only give you a view of current state as far as you're not having an STD. But what he wanted to know, kind of like the details of her kid's father, the details of any relationship after that. Right. I'm open. I'm an open person. I have no problem, you know, discussing past relationships. I I don't go that far back. But well, your baby daddy is on TV, so (laughs) you you (laughs) can't avoid that one. I didn't date a lot of people like I'm still I'm still on one hand. But regardless of that, I, sh- I shouldn't be forced right. to uh, give a description or go into detail about the relationship. Her her most recent boyfriend could have, you know, beat the shit out of her and she doesn't want to relive that in her mind. Right. And he, and may he have. has this like, I need to know about your history. I, I need to know if I can trust you, says the person that cheated on his and lied wife. and lied to her about his height. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, just, you're just saying, you know, like, yeah. And, and I don't have anything against both parties taking an STD test prior to engaging in a sexual relationship. I think that's, I think that's a healthy thing to do to make sure both parties are clean or everybody's aware of what is happening. You know, like say right. one of them has herpes or something like that should be full disclosure. Like, all of that before engaging in a mutual consensual sexual relationship. I don't have a problem with that. His demanding that she take this test is somehow a way of absolving her of his need to know every detail about her past relationships does not equate. Right. Um, Case closed. Case closed there. (laughs) Right. Because and then, you know, she throws it back at him and says, well, you need to get one, too. And he's just like, oh, but the labs here are dirty kind of (sighs) attitude. Oh, but it's okay for her. It's like it's good enough for you because you live here. You're used to this standard of living. But I'm not. That's where I kind of fell off the bandwagon for Ed, because, you know, it's like I can sympathize with him wanting to feel like things are on the up and up. 
I think I, I agree that he wanting to know about her past and wanting to know if she's, you know, free of illnesses are two separate things. Uh, in my opinion, and especially on the first one, you just you do that over time. You get to know the person and, you know, people are not always going to be. Uh, I, I, I take it that Ed is probably a little more open. It's, you know, he's from Southern California. He probably is a bit more used to sharing than that part of the world. And he just needs to to take time to build a rapport with her. And the information will will come as she becomes comfortable with him. Um. And to say that if that that taking an STD test will absolve her of having to talk about her past means that he really only cares about her past insofar as her sexual relationships are concerned, which it's not a really good message to send to somebody. Um, exactly. And I, 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 I actually I appreciated Rose being as real as she was. I, she got she got a plums uh, from me. Uh, but yeah, Ed really lost me when he uh, said, well, he's going to take it when he gets back. That That's not appropriate. That's saying that that's basically saying your clinics are dirty, but it's OK if they're if, if you put yourself in that environment. But not not for me. Um, he should have said yes here. Just hint, hint for, for any of you guys who might be future Eds. The embassy has a list of doctors that you can look up um, and pick one to go to. There's a large expat population in, in the Philippines. You can find a place of decent quality. Um, so he really, he really, uh, he really handled that situation poorly. And I don't know how much of that was, was kind of set up by the producers to create maximum drama or, and versus how much of that was just on him. But, um, clearly it was not a situation Rose, especially, appreciated being in as her reaction showed to us. Right. Yeah, yeah, very well said. I mean, I think I think also just like he has this sort of sense of entitlement that like she lives in such poor standards that it's okay for him to treat her like this. And that rubbed me the wrong way as well. Like, you know, he was such a prize and, you know, he was rescuing. I don't know if it's, you know, he's rescuing her, his, his Captain save a complex or whatever that like, of course she'll, you know, she'll give an STD test in these dirty clinics that I won't, but she will because she's so desperate to get out of here and I'm her ticket out. Like that's that, that came off of him as well. And it was just all just ugly and ick. And I was not a fan. Right. And if he was so worried about it, like uh, from a soft skills perspective, he could have had one first and actually talked to her about this instead of popping it up to her in person where she can't right. take time to create a response mm -hmm. and did his first and said, you know, hey, I just want to make sure we're open. I did this. This helps me. Blah, blah, blah. We build trust. Blah, blah, blah. But, you know, yeah. And I don't think a lot of people have a very good view of him now. So um, they did a good job at turning the tables and making us hate him <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, we do not have information at this point whether they are still together or not. Well, someone on Reddit posted his um, his dating pro his plenty of fish profile. Right. Well, we don't know right. if that's actually him or if it was a fake. Right. Right. I yeah, can I can make a lot of profiles for him. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I could easily do that. Yeah. Um, so we don't know. Um, we're, we're looking into some stuff, some uh, social media profiles. But at this point, we don't have anything one way or the other to, to show it. Um, right. I think that's. Visa questions. Yeah. OK. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I've received a fair number of questions uh, from the community on Reddit, so I'm going to go through a few of them. And if you guys have any questions that you've received, uh, feel free to ask. All right, so the first question, and I think this is actually a good one, is how will the current uh, coronavirus-related uh, border closings impact fiancé and spousal visa processing? And so I'm going to take a look at this question from the perspective of how does this affect the show? So we've heard that on March the 20th, um, all routine visa uh, activity was suspended around the world. USCIS is also in a reduced uh, processing mode that extends uh, 
you know, all across the the federal government. So I would say that there is a and, and given that we don't know when uh, routine visa services will be restored, it'll have to be at a point where the State Department lowers its travel warning and allows the staff embassy staff that's been uh, brought back here to the U.S. to return uh, to their postings overseas. They won't uh, resume visa services before that happens. Um, if we assume that that's not going to take place until probably the summer, which is, you know, I think a fair a fair assumption, um, we could see this potentially impacting a future, the, the next season of regular 90 day. I don't know what kind of a schedule they usually maintain, but if we assume that a lot of the filming takes place in the late spring and early to mid summer, uh, that those couples are not going to be uh, getting over here anytime soon. Now, maybe they'll, you know, delay and, you know, film in the fall and the winter, but we might see our, uh, our beloved season eight delayed as a result of the visa uncertainties. Interesting. Um, I have a question for you that came via came via Twitter that says, I have a question for agency. I know that we're done with season seven of 90 Day Fiance and you guys found Blake and Jasmine totally boring. I did, too. But I wanted to ask agency if someone ha who had applied for the visa lottery and did not get one would raise a red, red flag if they then applied for a K-1 visa or if this info would ever be no even be known. Sounds like Blake met Jasmine shortly after she found out that she did not get the least lottery visa. And before you answer, I don't know that we had any information on whether Jasmine applied for the, the lottery or not. We know her sister got it. That's why she's over here. We don't have any information about Jasmine's application status or lack thereof. So go ahead. Yeah, so I think... Depending on how far she got in the visa lottery, if she actually applied for a diversity visa, a visa officer would be able to see it in the system. If it didn't get very far, then that record might not be available. But And so it could potentially inform um, her thought process. But if the relationship with Blake is, is relatively well established, then it's not going to prevent her from getting a visa. We also need to keep in mind that Jasmine is from Finland. Finland is a visa waiver country, very low overstay rate, low incidences of illegal immigration. So the radar is just not up for people from Finland. So I don't think it, the fact that she may have applied for the DV uh, is going to really negatively uh, Im impact her. Now, if she had been from, you know, like a country in West Africa or uh, South America or Southeast Asia, then potentially it could have uh, could have impacted her. Got it. Got it. Okay. Next. Uh, okay. So I'm going to take another one from Reddit. This one goes back to our favorite persona non grata, Jeffrey. <laughs> um, someone asked, and we did address this previously, I will preview. How is Jeffrey able to travel to Russia when he has prior felony convictions and is facing more charges? Well, his that really rests on the Russian criteria for visa tourist visa eligibility. Um, they would have to, he would have had to disclose it to the Russians, and then they would have had to have that be a basis to refuse him the permission to travel. Um, and I don't think any of us are Russian visa experts, so it's it's hard to say whether that's a criteria or not. I think the real question is: Does his criminal background? Uh, necessitate any kind of pr protections from the United States government. And as we've discussed previously, someone with his record will have will by uh, by law, that's the International Marriage Broker Regulation Act, uh, which we call IMBRA, requires that uh, when Varia has her interview, if he petitions for her, that his background be disclosed to her. Uh, so the government will tell her of his uh, domestic violence uh, protect orders of protection and such things and his past criminal convictions before and then give her an opportunity to decide whether to proceed forward with her case or not. So that protection does exist. She will be made no she will have that information made available to her if Jeffrey hasn't told her about it, which it sounds like he doesn't plan to. <laughs> so um, another question on this is, are there any protections for for 
foreigners when there's a large age gap? The answer is, so for example, like a 60 year old man with a 20 year old girl or like a 35 year old woman with a bunch of kids dating a 20 year old. The answer is no. <laughs> um, you know, it's your adults. You have to kind of figure that out for yourself. Now, the question the visa officer will 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 ask is, is this relationship bona fide? Um, and right. they'll have to, but they're not the morality the police. <laughs> no, we're, we were not, we are not the morality police. We're not here to judge your life. And the, the visa officers who are uh, experienced realize that and, um, have to train younger officers that it's not their job to judge people. Um, I recall that, uh, being a, being an issue that we, we had to deal with, with younger officers, more junior officers when I was, when I was working. Okay. Um, I have a, I have a question from me from frauded. Mm -hmm. Um, there's speculation that Nicole is over in Morocco currently. Mm -hmm. And with all this COVID-19 stuff going on, people who are overseas, there's a lot of work being done to get these people home to the United States. Mm -hmm. I suspect they're working with their consular officers, because they're saying talking about going to the embassies and the embassies are coordinating whatever, getting them out of the country as as a former, you know, visa officer, consular officer, and also whatever the other job was that you've done. I forgot what it's called, like passport services, American citizen, citizen services. services. Can you talk a little bit about what is going on in the world, getting people like Nicole back if Nicole were to want to get back, if she were over there for real? Um, there was a post where her mom, Robley, said something about she has her reasons for not coming back. Allegedly, mom's sharing the story that she's over there as well and that she's not coming back at this point. And somebody asked her why, and she said she has her reasons. So just if you could talk a little bit about, from my own curiosity, what is going on with getting these people back to the United States. Sure. In situations like that, normal embassy functions are uh, refocused on to uh, providing services to American citizens. Um, that's part of why visa issuances have been suspended and routine passport services are suspended because the embassy is focused first and foremost on locating the American citizens that are in their district of responsibility, communicating with them, and then making them aware of the uh, available resources the government has has put forward. So in order for the government to, you know, help you, they have to know that you're there. There's a program called STEP uh, that you can register for when you go overseas. That means that if something happens during that window, the embassy has a way to contact you. And then you work with your embassy to get onto, for example, a charter flight. Sometimes they charter aircraft to take people back to the US, I believe. Um, when I was in, when they were, they, they did that in the Middle East during the uh, Arab Spring to get uh, American citizens out of the countries that were experiencing civil unrest. Mm. And you'd see that in other other situations as well. Uh, you know, I think they may have done something similar in Libya. Um, you know, there was a huge humanitarian effort made in Haiti after the large earthquake that happened there. And so you know, anytime there's a crisis, the government puts together a task force that monitors the situation continuously, um, you know, tries to communicate with all American citizens it's aware of that live in the affected area. Um, you know, there'll be someone, you know, they have a, a function that monitors, uh, you know, affairs 24 seven, there'll always be someone available for a person to communicate with, and then they'll just work with them to get them access to the, to the resources. But that's part of it. Again, that's why routine functions shut down because it takes a lot of work to coordinate these responses. Got it. Um, and some people, some people had reached out in addition to that and said that the hassle of the process that they were suggesting for people to get back from Morocco was more trouble than it was worth. Right. So there was the risk of getting infected while you're waiting in customs, both in I think they were routing them through London Heathrow and then getting them back through to the U.S. Like we saw the lines of people shoulder to shoulder for hours. Right. I probably would stay put myself, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's a you know, if you're going to try to bring a bunch of people out, you're going to have to have them be in close proximity to each other. Obviously, if you're able to get out on, on under your own resources, you can you can do that as well. Um, in terms of being cumbersome, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, anything we did in the government was cumbersome <laughs> just by its very nature. Right, right. <laughs> Pretty much. So we, our standard of judgment was really bad because everything for us was cumbersome. <laughs> we were just used to it. Right. That's just situation normal for you. Um, okay. Next question. Let's see. Um, let's see here. What was a good question? Are there countries of origin that automatically raise red flags because they're so well known for uh, scams? Yes. Um, <laughs> Yes, there are. The list changes constantly. Um, Nigeria is one of them. Each country, particularly countries that are uh, have uh, uneven distribution of their economic wealth, there are certain areas of the country that are always known to the consular community as being more high fraud than others. So I was in the high fraud district when I was working in my country, and uh, we knew we knew what we know we knew it down to the level of what towns to be uh, to look out for. So there's always going to be regions um, where there are uh, concerns, and it and it shifts constantly. You know, because countries go through periods of economic growth, periods of economic decline, civil unrest, and and all sorts of other things. But you can you can typically make the list up yourself. You know, countries that are poor tend to be seen as higher risk for illegal immigration. Um, okay. Let, let's see. If a U.S. citizen has felonies, how does that affect visa processing? Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't think the mere existence of a felony affects the ability to apply to petition for uh, immigration benefit. I will have to check on that. So, you know, if I can already feel the ground shaking, I'm sure someone thinks I'm saying something wrong. <laughs> um, now, I think that there are certain categories of crime that can make you ineligible. For example, committing immigration fraud. Um, I thought you were going to say committing murder. So and I'd be like, well. That, well, that too. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you've committed, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're in jail, maybe you're in prison, maybe you've served prison time for a murder and you're out now and you want to marry Svetlana. I don't know. But it was writing, to, it was writing to you while you were in prison. You know, we have a. Well, that's when, that's, that's when the protections like of disclosing prior crimes would be, uh, would come into play to help protect people like that. As far as what can get you disqualified from ever being able to petition at all, it's going to depend on, that's going to require a little bit of legal analysis that I haven't uh, done. Um, but I don't think it's a carte blanche prohibition. Got it. So if we have like a 90 day fiance love after lockup mashup where the, the pen pal was a foreigner and now they want a petition for them to get over to the United States. <laughs> 90 days after lockup. I smell a crossover <laughs> 90 days after lockup. Oh, man. TLC, are you listening? Um, <laughs> let's see. All right. Let's look at some other some other ones. We've got time for a few more. Um, someone's asking about visitor visas and why foreign fiancés can don't always get to have their families come over. That's because if you're from a fan, if you're from a country that's seen as a high risk of potentially overstaying, they're going to uh, refuse refuse the case. That's a lot of times why people have to pursue the immigrant visa route is because they can't get over on a non-immigrant visa, but then their family can't stay because you know their the family generally can't get a visa because they're also seen as having over overstay risk. Um, which is a, it's, it's a constant headache for, for people. All right. Well, um, I think we got one time I for think, one more. I think that's it for the questions okay. I want to address this time. Okay. Someone did ask a question requiring a bit more, I think, time and preparation, but maybe we'll want to get to at, um, at some point. It's not a particularly happy topic. It's, it's on the topic of child brides. Oh, yeah, That's an interesting I, I topic. We'll, it's a it's a very comp, it's a very complicated topic, oh. and so one that I can't I can't give justice to in just a few minutes. Okay, well, excellent. We'll save that for a future episode. Um, one, it, we don't really have a big social media roundup. We just have one item in this, our social media roundup, <laughs> and that is that Mike of the aliens and Natalie got married. In Washington, mm -hmm. woo! 
Uh, they, got, they got married recently. It's been out there all over. And um, congratulations. That's within the 90-day window of when she came over. So it was just a matter of time before that wedding certificate turned up. So there we go. Um, that's it. That's it for social media. Um, shameless self-promotion. Close out. All right. You can find me lurking on the 90-day subreddit. Um, or you can find me at my website, askthevisaofficer.com, where I provide a variety of visa-related services. If you have questions about the show, you can contact me through the contact form on that website, uh, and I'll be happy to hear from you in whatever capacity you decide to uh, to engage. Excellent. Hanakawa? All right. So you can find me on Instagram at 90 Day Fiance Today. Uh, that's where I dwell all day and night. So <laughs> stop on by. <laughs> stop on by. And I am frauded by TLC. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter. You can find the Fraudcaster Facebook group on Facebook. Uh, we also have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the Fraudcast, where we cover uh, other reality TV shows. Right now it's Married at First Sight, and which is kind of a snooze fest this season, and Love After Lockup, which just concluded this past weekend. Uh, we also put out a bonus episode about covering Love is Blind, uh, which I just heard today is going to have season two. They are casting for it currently. So if you're interested in that, go out there and um, check that out. We also have, as I mentioned earlier, a test run of a video watch along of me and hetero life mate watching Love Me, the Russian uh, bride, male or bride tourism documentary. Uh, it for some reason cut off at like minute 39, so it's not the, even the full one. Um, but that's there on P Patreon as well. Just we're, you know, had some extra time, so we're playing with extra content. And, um, you can find me also on Instagram Friday nights at Frauded Night Live on Instagram Live and come up and stop on by for some fun and gossip. And I think that's it. So thank you guys for joining us. Happy quarantine. We'll talk to you later. We are the Fraudcast and we're dumpster diving so you don't have to. This Fraudcast has been produced and edited by yours truly. Art by Sarah Dotty. Music written, produced, and performed by Umami. Segment producer at iHeartReality TV shows. Further assistance provided by many unnamed fraud consultants. I'd be like, tighten up, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Tighten up your coochie. How about that? <laughs>